Okay, let's start it. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to CNTC seminar. It is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Patri D from MIT as our seminar speaker. Uh, Patri actually needs no introduction. He's a well-known condensed matter theories for his uh, groundbreaking works on various topics, uh, such as mesoscopy physics, disorder system, quantum spin liquid, fractional quantum hole, and high temperature superconductivity. He was awarded the 1991 Oliver Buckley Prize and the 2005 uh, Dirac Medal of ICTP for his uh, contributions on weak localization, universal conductance fluctuation, and the interacting many body system. Today, he's going to tell us about a tale of two transition metal dichrochogenide, um, tantalum uh, dicelluline and the tungsten ditelluride. Uh, please take it away, Patrick. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for uh, the uh, invitation. And uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I always tell my students not to try to give two talks, uh, two topics in one talk. So I'm violating this uh, principle. Uh, I hope I can get away with it. But uh, there's uh, at least some common trends uh, relating the two. Um, they are both um, monolayer uh, TMD, so the, uh, um, the transition metal dichrochogenized, which is uh, getting, I think this whole system is getting a lot of uh, renewed interest now nowadays uh, because they're, um, they, you know, you can be peeled with the scotch tape. In fact, uh, uh, I knew about scotch tape about 40 years ago. Uh, um, um, and, and I think the systems that were peeled were exactly these uh, TMD. Uh, that, that was way before graphene. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and now we know that uh, um, uh, these compounds are extremely rich. Uh, and, uh, and there are many of them. Uh, so today I focus on two of them. Uh, the tandem that self selenide and sulfides and actually three, yeah. So the sulfide and selenide are uh, kind of together. So tantalum is here. Oh, can you see my, okay, let me get my uh, pointer here. Oh yeah. Yeah, can, you can see my pointer. Yes, right? yes. Yeah, so uh, tantalum is here in sulfur and selene, of course, the other uh, charcogenics. Um, and um, so these uh, mod insulators, in fact, I, I would call them uh, cluster mod insulators. So it's a little bit different from traditional mod insulators. And uh, it's very interesting to me uh, because uh, I think these are very good candidates as a possible quantum spin liquid. In fact, they're a very interesting kind, which is one that has a spin on Fermi surface. So it's very exotic uh, if, it's, if it's true. And the second uh, story is uh, the tungsten ditellurite. Uh, so the tungsten lives here and uh, tellurium is here. Uh, so this, I call this a jack of all trade in uh, TMD because it, it does everything. It's a, uh, it's a um, quantum hall uh, system. Um, uh, it's, it's a superconductor when it's doped. And, uh, and um, people are saying that it's actually a tonic insulator. So it's, it's uh, actually, uh, so that also makes it a very interesting. Uh, and there were reports of uh, quantum oscillations, uh, which of course is very unexpected in an insulator. So uh, that's why I find these uh, two materials very interesting. I would like to uh, uh, share with you uh, uh, their properties. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, these are side by side on the periodic table. So that means that uh, tandem dicelenide has an odd number of uh, uh, electrons actually uh, per unit cell. And so that's why it could become a mod insulator. So it's, you know, if you have an odd number of electron per unit cell, it's either a metal or a uh, mod insulator, okay? Now tungsten dichloride has an even number of uh, electron per unit cell. And that uh, would end up being a, um, um, uh, either, either a band insulator or a um, uh, semi-metal, okay? So naively, it turns out that it should be a semi-metal. And the thought is that it becomes uh, insulated because of some other mechanism. Okay, so I'll get into that. So let me start with um, tandem disulfide. Um, so these are all these layered uh, transition metal that are organized. They are <clears throat> um, uh, Van der Waal materials. And the structure is that you have the 
tendulum that forms a triangle lattice. Okay, if you look at the top. And it's surrounded by cages, this uh, sulfur cages. So you can think of the cage as a, as a triangular lattice uh, on top and one at the bottom. And one T is a polytype, which means that the two <coughs> triangles are, are shifted in such a way that they, they, uh, um, they form an up triangle, uh, the, the bottom layer form an up triangle and the top layer form a down triangle, okay? Uh, this is in contrast with the one uh, H, where it's a prismatic configuration, so the two the two triangles line up for forming a, uh, a prism. Okay, so um, so this thing has inversion symmetry, um, right? And this has been studied uh, for a long time, um, forty five years ago already. Um, um, there's a famous review article by Wilson, Di Salvo, and Bajan. Uh, these are studied. Uh, for the interest as a charge density wave materials. Um, so it turns out that this thing <clears throat> uh, forms a charge density wave and the charge order is an uh, interesting one. Uh, it's uh, the unit cell is a 13. Okay, so here I, I'm just plotting only the um, tandem sites. So as I said, the tandem forms a triangle, triangular lattice. So for our purpose, we can forget about the sulfur. The sulfur is just, uh, 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 do the charge transfer and whatever. And so the the uh, the charge density wave is that you form a, a new unit cell, which is a 13 by 13 site unit cell. Okay, so this is a larger and large unit cell. And in fact, it's best to think of it as a collection of a star of David. Okay, this this is a star of David with up triangle and a down triangle. If you include the one in the middle, there are exactly 13 uh, sites in the star of David, okay? And you can tile the lattice with the star of David forming another triangle, okay? So this charge order is in fact a charge order of uh, triangle, is a triangular lattice of star of David. We can, that's the easiest way to think about it, okay? Um, right, so we can think of each star of David as a cluster, okay? Uh, and uh, once you form this charge sensor, it turns out that at low temperature, <clears throat> this becomes an insulator, okay? And in fact, it's, uh, it's quite unique because uh, this is actually the only charge density wave system in two dimension that is a uh, insulator in the ground state, okay? So this is old data, that resistivity. Uh, you can see that there's a transition, the first order transition of 200 Kelvin. And at low temperature, the resistivity turns up, okay? Uh, and so it's, it's an insulator. Now, all other um, um, dichalcogenides dichalcogen that have been studied, uh, for example, the 2H uh, polytype uh, and, and so on, they actually become a better uh, metal after the transition. So this is the charge into a transition and the resistivity goes down, okay? Um, and this actually is, is easier to understand because uh, in two dimension, when you have, uh, unlike one dimension, in one dimension, when you have a charge density wave, then um, your, your Fermi surface is completely gapped out, right? Because uh, you have this one dimensional Fermi surface. Right? Um, and then the ground state should be an insulator. In two dimension, generally, you know, if you try to uh, shift the Fermi surface, they're not perfectly nested. So, so gen generally, you don't get to gap out the full Fermi surface unless it's quasi 1D. So in two-dimensional system, uh, the ground state is actually an, an insulator. So what you have is that you have small pockets of, uh, of Fermi surface and you gap out some, some of the uh, original Fermi surface. And resistivity goes down because um, you have less scattering. Right? You have less density of states and you have less scattering. So, this one T tandem sulfide is actually very unique, is an insulator. And now if you remember what I told you that there's an odd number of electron per unit cell uh, originally, let's say that's, uh, let's say one per tandem. Now you have 13 per unit cell, but 13 is still odd, right? So according to the band theory, this can only be a metal or uh, if it's not a metal, it must be a odd insulator. It can, must be driven by, by Coulomb interaction, right? Oh, by the way, uh, please uh, ask, interrupt me as I go along. Uh, it's better to 
I prefer to be interrupted with questions uh, so that I, I know that I'm not losing everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, uh, I guess uh, yeah, you can you can either unmute yourself or just yeah, just interrupt me. <coughs> yeah. I'm sorry. May I, in that case, may I interrupt you? Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, so there has been uh, this talk about doubling of unit cells in the tantalum disulfide where you would get uh, even numbers of electrons per unit cell and in that case a band insulate. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I'll get to that. You mean interlayer, doubling between layers. Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an option. Yeah. But if you stick to one layer, uh, then then this is the only option. So and this is in fact why I'm interested in the monolayer. Uh, this is what I'm getting to. Yeah. Right. So that Thank you the, the bulk is ambiguous. So I, we want to study monolayer. So yeah, if there's monolayer, then we don't have that uh, problem. Okay. Yeah. So this by itself doesn't prove that it's a spin liquid, but it, it's at least it's uh, interesting. <clears throat> that is, uh, but it's, it's uh, the only insulator that, that we know. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Very good. Okay, so uh, nowadays you have much better transport data, right? So you can see that the resistivity goes up by several orders of magnitude. So, so it is it is uh, really a, a, a insulator. Uh, okay, and uh, so the understanding is that um, when you have a large unit cell like this, you have band folding, and then you get narrow bands, uh, and then Coulomb repulsion uh, would drive you into the mount insulator. Uh, as at least uh, strong correlation is important because uh, in the bulk form without distortion it's known that these uh, TMDs are generally not strongly correlated uh, because the bands are quite, quite, quite wide. But now this is uh, already very familiar. So, uh, so you can say, say that this system is actually the granddaddy of, uh, of the twisted bilayer graphene today where, where, whereby by band folding you, you create a flat band, okay. <clears throat> However, um, if you still stick with this one layer description, uh, if it is a mod insulator, then we expect uh, local moment formation. Uh, and then uh, in the usual mod insulator, uh, the ground state should be an antiferromagnet because of antiferromagnetic change. Uh, however, there's no um, sign of local moment formation. Uh, there's no Curie law. Uh, so this is a susceptibility. There's a very, very small Curie tail, but this uh, only corresponds to a few percent, uh, 10 to minus four, 10 to minus three uh, per cluster. So it's like 10 to minus four per, per tandem. It's a very small Curie tail. So this is just a little bit of impurity, you know, but here we expect uh, one spin per 13 sites. So the Curie tail should have been much bigger if, if, it were, if there were local moment. So there are no, not even sign of local moment. Uh, uh, up to 200 Kelvin. So this is uh, uh, rather strange. And okay, so just to show that this is a insulator, there's a very nice STM results, uh, tunneling results. Uh, they can directly image this uh, South David, right? it's very beautiful, it's uh, commensurate um, uh, unit cell. And uh, you can see the what they call the upper hopper band and the lower hopper band. This is tunneling, zero is here, you can see the gap. Right, so this is this measures the, the local density of states, um, and um, the bandwidth. If you interpret this as the so-called upper upper band, uh, then the bandwidth is uh, about hundred. The full width is about hundred millivolts. Uh, the charge gap is about a couple hundred millivolts. Uh, yeah, so you might say that well, the U, how about U is about two hundred millivolts. So, so you think think of this as a strongly correlated system. Yeah, because the, the bandwidth is, uh, is quite narrow. Uh, oops. <clears throat> okay, so uh, several years ago, uh, uh, Vic Law and I proposed that uh, uh, because of the absence of uh, the signs of local moment formation, um, this may be an example of a quantum spin liquid. So the idea is that uh, a quantum spin liquid is the idea that due to quantum fluctuation, you cannot get into this ordered nail state. But instead, the spins form into a singlet. So there are many kinds of uh, quantum spin liquid. Uh, some of them are gapped, where you form singlet gaps. But uh, the one that's uh, most interesting is that you have a Fermi surface, so uh, what is called spin arms, right? So this has to do with uh, spin charge separation, fractionalization. 
So the 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 you, the low energy spin excitations, I like electrons that have lost the charge. So they carry only spin, but since they're fermions, in principle, they can form a Fermi surface. Uh, so that would be something amazing, very exciting uh, to see. And at the same time, there were similar proposals uh, made by uh, a couple of groups, and they did actually MUSR measurements and found no, indeed, there's no magnetic order down to 70 mini Kelvin. However, as uh, uh, was pointed out, there's an escape route because uh, it turns out that these um, uh, this star of David uh, is known to form uh, stacking in bilayer uh, type. So each layer has a star of David, but two layers may stack directly on top of each other. So this is the stacking of the modulation of the charge modulation. So in that case, if, if they're stacking on top of each other, then you can uh, uh, make a single formation between the two layers, between the two uh, cluster, okay? And then this, this will form a, a single state, okay? So in that case, um, a single state would still be, uh, would be due to interlayer single uh, uh, formation. Uh, then uh, morally, this is uh, smoothly related to a, a band insulator, okay? Even though the driving force uh, we should still think of the driving force for the insulator is smart, right? Uh, uh, because that's the big physics, the big, big energy is the uh, uh, Coulomb repulsion. But the low energy excitations may become uh, just uh, uh, this dimers, uh, and and so. However, uh, already there's some evidence against it because the diamond picture would create uh, predict a full gap, but at least uh, from the um, NQR data, uh, they say that they don't see a, a, a full cap. Okay. Um, and uh, after that, uh, some very interesting data appeared. Um, uh, the group of Matsuda, uh, they report, uh, they did thermal conductivity measurements on these, uh, on these uh, crystals. And they reported there's a linear term in the thermal conductivity. Uh, so they, here's a plot of thermal conductivity by, divided by T as a function of t square, so it's a kind of standard plot. Uh, so the t square uh, is maybe due to phonons, right? So usually phonons uh, dominate the thermal conductivity, but at very low temperature, you can pick out uh, some residual. And this thing is claimed to have a finer intercept when you extrapolate to zero temperature. So this is very unusual because the cap over t uh, being constant is what you usually associate with a metal. Right? Uh, uh, by Wiedemann Franz law, cap over T is proportional to the conductivity, so you, to the electrical conductivity. And we know that the electrical conductivity of a metal goes to a constant. So this uh, is usually associated with a, uh, uh, with a metal. And of course, the phonon cannot give you a constant, it will be higher power because the tensor states of phonon, the specific heat of phonon is a small as T cubed. Okay, and they, they claim to see it in a couple of samples and, and uh, it's insensitive to, to, to magnetic field, right? To even 12 Tesla doesn't change it very much. So at the face of it, uh, this would suggest strongly that you actually have mobile fermions because you know, to get thermal conductivity, you, not only do they, you have to have a finite tensor state of fermions, but they have to be mobile uh, to carry the heat. And uh, so the only option, if this is really correct, is that you have spin-on Fermi surface because we don't have a charge. Remember, this is a charge insulator, right? And it's carrying heat like a, like a metal. So some similar data has been reported in the organics and there was taken, as a, again, very good evidence that that was a spin-on Fermi surface uh, system. However, I should say that this uh, data has been controversial. There's another group that, uh, that uh, claimed not to see this um, so there's an argument about the quality of the sample and so on, because, you know, of course, thermal conductivity, this depends on the um, mean free parts, it's linear and the mean free parts. So, um, so not seeing it uh, could mean that you just have a disordered sample. And Matsuda claims that they can purposely make their uh, sample uh, disordered by irradiation and make this uh, extrapolation go away. So, uh, so I think, uh, there's some argument, but um, 
to date, this is the strongest uh, evidence that this uh, may be a, a quantum spin liquid with spin on premises. Okay. All right. Okay. So because of this uh, controversy, uh, it would be very interesting to go to a single layer, right? If you can do mono layer, um, which you can do by scotch taping, uh, uh, then um, then you 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 and if this thing, if this thing stays in a mod insulator, then you have something interesting, right? Because uh, this this uh, escape route is, is now taken away. Uh, you cannot form a, a, a trivial singlet uh, between two layers. Okay, so this was uh, actually done by my Chromis group. Uh, they have a couple of papers. There's one uh, that's already published, and this one is on uh, archive that uh, hopefully will be published soon. Um, that uh, I was I was involved in the second one. Um, um, yeah. So first uh, they claim that uh, yeah. So uh, instead of looking at tandem disulfide, they chose to look at tandem diselenide. Okay, so this is just switching the charcoalized, and it, it really shouldn't change the physics too much. Hopefully, uh, now it turns out that this thing is metallic in the bulk. This already tells you something interesting that uh, that these systems are actually very close to the uh, the Lamarck transition. If you just switch out the charcoalized, then you can the bulk goes from being a metal to, uh, insulated to a metal. However, it's been known for a long time that the top layer is gapped, uh, is an insulator uh, from RPS. There's no state at the Fermi level. And this is confirmed by uh, uh, STM tunneling data. So they took a single layer of this, what now is a one key tandem diselenide. Uh, and again, they can image the uh, star of David. So each one of this uh, thing is actually already a star of David. So, so now you can see that the star of David itself form a triangular lattice, right? A nice triangular lattice, okay? Uh, and they can uh, do tunneling and they see indeed that this is zero, that there's a, a mod gap, that there's zero density state at the Fermi level. There is a, um, a, a, um, a valence band and a conduction band, okay? So now it's clear that this is an insulator and this must be a mod insulator, right? Because there's no ambiguity about having an odd number of uh, sites being used up. There's some complications in that there seems to be two um, um, conduction band, but um, let's not worry about this at least for now. Okay, so are we convinced that this is a modern state enough? Okay. okay, so, but of course, um, it's hard to know whether this thing is magnetically ordered or not because we have only one layer, so you cannot do susceptibility. You cannot do, uh, you don't even know that where there's a, a local moment formed. However, uh, let me just mention that there is actually strong evidence. Now, the same group, uh, the same experimental group uh, showed that there's actually strong evidence that there is local moment. And they did something very clever. They put this one uh, T tandem disulfide on top of uh, 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 the one H tandem disulfide. I, I, I misspoke, it's both disulfide. Remember the one H is a uh, metal. And so now they see something that looks like a condo effect. <laughs> and because they see a peak in the uh, conductance uh, at, at the Fermi level. So from that, they infer that there's signs of local moment. But uh, I don't want to talk about that today. But I want to talk about a, a second thing that they saw, which is uh, again, uh, very unusual. And what they report is that uh, what they call super modulation. Okay, it turns out, remember I, uh, in the last graph, I showed you that this uh, star David pattern itself forms a triangular lattice. But when they look very carefully, it turns out that it's not exactly a triangular lattice. There's a modulation on top of this triangular lattice. Okay, so from now on, it's best for us to think of the, this as your unit. So this is our cluster. Just think of this as like a molecule or, or an atom, one, 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 one object, right? So. Uh, at zero of order, they form, this thing forms a triangular lattice, okay, which is the mod insulator. But uh, when they look carefully, it turns out that there's actually modulation of this triangular lattice. It's not uniform. It itself is discordant, okay. And you know, it's, it's not so easy to pick out from the real space. But you know, these uh, experimenters they usually do Fourier transform of this. So they take this 
this is the, uh, the pattern, uh, the static image of an SDM image. They take Fourier transform of this. And, uh, you know, Fourier transform is much better at picking out um, periodic structure than, than your eye can in the real uh, structure because of pi. There's a pi uh, in, in when you do a Fourier transform. Yeah. So I like to tell my experimentalists who do uh, scattering for a living that the, the entire living is based on pi. Um, right. Okay. So, yeah. So they utilize, you can see that now if they, if they do um, Fourier transform, you can see that there are peaks uh, inside. So this is the unicell, this is real one zone for the um, Star of David unicell. Okay, so these are the black spots, right? Okay, and you can see the black spots. This is correspond to the original, not the original, but the cluster unicell. And the real one zone is, you've cut this in half. So this is your, your real one zone. And inside this real one zone, they see this extra spots. Okay. So these extra spots correspond to an incommensurate modulation of the original lattice. Okay, and it's a, and you, they see this uh, as a function of energy because in STM you can pick out the energy. So they see this at uh, um, near the uh, at, well at at the uh, the same thing at the lower Hubble band energy minus 0.2, uh, upper Hubble band and then both of them 0.2. And 26, and they don't see this when they go to very high energy. There's no no modulation. So these modulation are associated with these uh, low energy uh, pieces which are on the surface. Okay, Patrick, uh, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so actually, it's a, uh, in the previous slide uh, when you show this uh, David star cluster. Yeah. I noticed that it's actually more like a triangle. That means uh, originally the originally maybe the C six rotation is uh, broken down to. Um, I think that must be an artifact of the exactly how they measure. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah, there may be some. Yeah, I don't know the understand the detail, but for example, if you look here, right, you, you do see the triangle. I see. Yeah, you you see the star there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe it. Uh, yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I don't know exactly why it looks like a triangle. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that could be some, uh, you know, that, I wonder if this has to do with energy. Hmm. Allowed to be finite density. That finite energy can, can your, uh, yeah, it could be a wave function. Right, because th this is not the static, this is not the integrating of all energy. Right, mm -hmm. this is some fixed energy. So, you know, you can have, uh, you can have different, they have uh, different patterns uh, at, at a fixed energy. But I, I'm not sure, you, uh, you have a good point. I don't know whether you can break the, the six fold rotation. Um, but uh, is there a six fold axis or just three fold? Um, Okay, yeah, I, I don't know the, yeah, that's a good point, but I, I don't think there's any evidence for Okay, thank you. So I didn't answer your question fully. Okay, so now back to this story. So, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the point is that in an insulator, uh, it's very unusual to see a, uh, a, a incommensurate uh, charge structure, right? In a, in a metal, then we have a pyrus distortion, we have a nesting and charge sensitive wave spin density formation. Uh, in, a, in an insulator, it's rather rare to have this incommensurate uh, thing. Uh, the exceptions may be some, there are some spiral magnets that are driven by your Cincy Moria interaction in insulator, and they have local moments, have spirals. Um, but uh, so here we, we find this, uh, they found this uh, distortion. Uh, so one is tempted to relate these to the Fermi surface of the spin on that, right? So let me <clears throat> remind you that in the spin on story, what we expect is a half filled um, <clears throat> Fermi surface, right? Because we have one uh, spin on per unit cell. Again, I'm talking about this reduced unit cell of the 13 by 13 site, okay? Right, so, <clears throat> and we expect a nearest neighbor hopping. So the band structure is quite simple. Uh, it turns out that it's almost a, a circular, the, the, the Fermi surface, right? So we can compute exactly what this is. We know the length, right? 
I'll, I'll defer me uh, way back. Then. Okay. And so it turns out that uh, uh, we can account for the, the exact location of where they see this uh, uh, distortion in the following way, right? So let's take a 2KF. So 2KF usually is a spanning vector across the Fermi level. But here, because of the repeated unit cell is equivalent to this vector, right? Which I call P1. So these, these are, you can think of this as a as kind of nesting vector between two parallel Fermi surfaces. So if there's a, a charge order, for example, if there were a charge density wave or a spin density wave, you might expect it to live at this uh, period, okay? I'm sorry, may I ask you again? Yeah. Uh, now, what is the reason that you can uh, uh, actually model this with just nearest neighbor hoppings, uh, tight binding? Yeah, uh, the reason is that um, in the spin-on story, uh, uh, what is hopping is the J, is the exchange coupling, okay? And so we expect the J to be mainly nearest neighbor, right? Uh, because uh, these clusters are, are the, the wave function, of course, are, are, should be extended over the cluster, right? So I, I think uh, we should be able to uh, model it by, by nearest neighbor exchange. And then is the nearest neighbor exchange that is. So again, this is exchange between clusters, okay? So we're not talking about, you know, uh, hopping between tandem atoms. We're talking about hopping between two clusters. And this is why it's uh, nearest neighbor. And why is there then only one uh, particle per side, one spin on? Oh, oh, okay. I, I, I should have explained. Yeah, there are 13, right? So you can think of 12 of them as being gapped. They are a pair, right? So, um, yeah, 13 of them become, 12 of them become tri trivial. Okay. But they, they become conventional bands. Right? And because of this band folding, you're basically left with one. There's only one state that cross the Fermi level. No, but I mean, uh, you said the one spin on per site, as far as I remember. No, no, one spin on per one. Yeah, but the other, uh, you, you know, the other ones don't need to be spin on. They can be electron pairs, right? The other 12 are out of the picture completely in this mod picture, in this cluster mod. That's why it's the cluster mod, right? So, but in general, in any mod insulator, the even electrons don't count. Right, they, they are trivial, right? Uh, I think my question was rather that uh, does a single uh, localized moment per unit cell mean a single spin on per unit cell? Yeah, so, so the picture is that there's only one local moment per 13 site. Yeah, right, that's the starting point. Do, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, by unit cell, I of course meant the charges to wave. Uh, cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I'm talking about. This is all, these unit cells are all 13 side unit cells. Is that? Yes, sir. Hmm? Does that answer your question? No. I, I, I'm still, I'm, okay. I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding your question. Well, uh, the, the time mining you're modeling it with, uh, you are using the, uh, assuming you have uh, one particle per site and you can, and as such, you can use the just the tight binding. And yeah, can... so I'm assuming one particle per the per per twelve units per for the per cluster, right? One particle per uh, cluster. Yes. Right, and then there's hopping between clusters. Okay, so maybe maybe a real space picture. Let me go back to the right. So here, so this is one cluster. I've, let's completely forget about the original lattice, right? Original lattice, right? And I'm assuming that there's only one local moment here, one local moment here, one local moment here, okay? Because the other 12 are trivial. I don't, I don't need to worry about them anymore, okay? I mean, if you, if you wish, I can go back to the, uh, to the band, you know, the band, you know, you have the spaghetti of bands. So the other 12 are here. They're all doubly occupied. And there's only okay, one that costs more. I understand this picture, but um, I think when you were talking about uh, uh, the tight binding, you were you were talking about spin-ons, not electrons, right? Yeah, yeah, but the spin-ons are formed out of the, yeah. So so the steps you, you take, 
is that you take this mod insulator and you first formulate it, for example, with a hub as a Hubble model. Okay. So in that Hubble model, you have a T, which is just a hopping between the, the local sites. Okay. So there's an effective T, which is describing the hopping between this one site. I don't care about any of these other sites. I just want to care. I just care about, you know, there's one, one electron here that I care about. So I care about how it moves, right? So there's an effective T, which will be given by some effective bandwidth here of the, of the band calculation. Right? Okay, so you get the spinons from the electron band structure, which is described by the single. Yeah, so I first make a Hubble model of the cluster, right? And that this will become some T, there's a T and then some U, which is on these sites. Yeah, and once I have that, then I have exchange coupling, right? Which is T square over U, which now is dominated by this nearest neighbor site. Okay, so the T, the the exchange coupling between these sites are, would be very weak, right? Because my cluster, my, my one electron wave function is going to look like this, right? It's going to sit somewhere here. So it's going to overlap this guy, but the overlap with this guy will be very small. Yes, okay. I think that answers my question. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, it takes a little getting used to. Um, yeah, so the, so the emphasis is that let's forget about original tandem and think about this one per site. Okay, very good. Okay, yeah, so, so then we just use this uh, uh, simple um, nearest neighbor model. And then we, we know exactly what this uh, wave vector is. Okay, now, but what they see, the dot is here, not here. However, if I add these two vectors, P1 and P2 as a vector, then I, I can predict exactly the, this dot. Okay, so that's shown here. Uh, this blue circle, the center of the blue circle is constructed in this way. You take a 2KF here, 2KF here, you add them and you get this. Okay. So I would claim that uh, we can explain uh, the lo exact location of this distortion by the following uh, so-called composite order. Okay. So the idea is that uh, what they observe is actually not the primary order, but a composite so rho corresponds to a density modulation as some wave vector, which I call Q1 plus Q2. Sorry, I switched notation. Yeah, sorry, band. Uh, this should be P, right? So this think of this as P1 and P2, okay? So uh, the Q is actually P1 plus P2. Yeah. And, and so the idea is that there's a hidden order, which actually corresponding to this. So for example, imagine that this is a charge, a spin density wave. There's a spin density wave that's created at P1, right? And this another one is created at P2, right? If I take two spin density wave, I can form a charge density wave, right? It's that's well known that uh, is allowed by Landau uh, theory, right? So this becomes a composite, what is called a composite order, okay? Now in STM, they do not see spin order, so they cannot see the spin density wave, right? So this is hidden, right? So there's an open question what this guy is. So one candidate is spin density wave. Another one that I like is so-called pair density wave uh, from pairing of the spin on. So this becomes even more exotic, okay? But the idea is that there's some hidden order that is not seen and what they see is actually a composite order, okay? So this, I, I think it, uh, it is strong, it's suggest, very suggestive of a spin on Fermi surface even though the KF itself was not directly seen, but we're seeing a sum of two, uh, two KF. That's the thing. Um, to, to emphasize this a little bit more, they've done this experiment also uh, instead of, I think these are on graphite substrate. They also put it on uh, this highly oriented uh, uh, graphite. Now, this is on graphene substrate, bilayer graphene. This is on, uh, on graphite substrate. And most of the time, uh, they see the same thing, right? Um, yeah, they see the same thing most of the time. But in two out of 10 cases, they see the distortion, this, uh, this, they see a different distortion. This, the point goes here, right? But this point turns out to be exactly twice P1, right? If you go twice P1, you, you get this. So there's another composite order, which is 
uh, at the twice wave vector. And they see this too, and sometimes. But why they see this sometimes here, sometimes that, we don't know. Yeah. But again, uh, by the, both these things are pointing towards some, <clears throat> some kind of a, um, a background, um, uh, some hidden order. Okay, that's all I want to say. Okay, so, um, right. So, so Patrick, I think there is a question. Uh, uh, just please unmute uh, yourself. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, could you explain again how the spin density wave leads to charge density wave? Because I thought the spinons are neutral and somehow it's leading to. Uh, you drop off. I couldn't hear the rest of the sentence. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you explain again how the uh, spin density wave leads to charge density wave? Because I thought the spinons are neutral. So, how does it lead to modulation in the charge? Uh, Yang Zhi, okay. can you hear? Them? Can you repeat the question? Um, I, so I think, yeah, I think uh, he he's asking uh, why uh, the the charge density way. Uh, I mean, two spin two spin density way is equivalent to one charge density way. Oh, you mean why is it composite? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, why so, why this happens? Is that right, a question? Right, right. So um, I'm just confused how neutral spinons can lead to charge density, uh, like modulation of charge density oh. wave? Oh, just wait, I think we lost Patrick. Oh. Just uh, hold on. <laughs> oh, you're muted now, Patrick. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was not able to uh, uh, hear. So let me let me go on, and maybe you can ask at the end. Uh, please yeah. uh, share your screen again. Uh, we don't see your. Oh. No, For some I, reason. Uh, something. Oh, well, maybe maybe my internet is bad. Oh. Okay. So that's why I couldn't hear. Okay. So what do I do? Do I escape first? So, so in the meantime, uh, uh, you can also type your question in the chat and then I think uh, everyone can see. Yeah, but I cannot see, so you have to read Yeah, I, I, can, I can read it for you or we can, we can look at that uh, at the end of the talk. Okay. So now, how do I do this? Do I end slideshow first? Uh, um, so you first uh, uh, put a share screen. Yeah, sure. And then you select the, the screen you want to share and uh... okay, let me let me end this. Let me end the slideshow. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. And then I have to I have to do this whole thing over again. Okay. Ah, okay, wait a minute. Um, yeah, I think my internet is giving me trouble. So let me uh, sometimes I have to go off and come back up. Let me just. Yeah, your camera, your 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 camera seems to frozen. Uh. Yeah. Okay. You can hear me, right? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. So in that case, maybe you can uh, stop your video and maybe that would uh, help on the internet. Yeah, I think I'm stuck. Yeah, yeah, Zoom is not responding. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, yeah, good, okay, good. Can you see my screen or no? No, not yet. Uh, please uh, just uh, share screen again. Okay.
So I, now I don't have an option to, oh, wait a minute. Okay, share, oh, that video. Mm -hmm. Share screen. Okay. Right, let's share. Okay, I'm, I'm back in this. It's getting there. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm back in business. Uh, I have to let me switch. Okay. Okay. I have to switch the setting. Mm -hmm. Just switch to the present. Uh, you probably want to. Now it's in the presenter's mode. Uh, uh, I have to escape, right? Okay, now what do I do? Uh, hmm. I want to, what happens? Okay. Can you share? Oh, am I back? Um, no, we don't see your uh, slideshow uh, for some reason. It's weird. Okay. Um, so we now we see uh, your email and your Gmail <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Oh, my secret. Over there. Yes. Okay. Now you see this. You see this, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yeah, but it's not in the full screen. Okay. So, but I have to switch screen. How do I switch? I have to, I guess I have two screens. That's the problem. I see. I see. Uh, but one side. So if I, I think what I did before is I made a full. I have to uh, press the full screen. Yeah, press that button. Yeah, I think so. Right. Okay. Uh, but now I have to change. Should be the display setting because we did uh, it okay. in the very beginning. Oh, oh yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, swap. Mm hmm okay we're back <laughs> sorry okay good 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 it took took a while okay yeah i don't know what happened okay all right so okay. sorry for the interruption okay so yeah so let me just just go on and uh, okay please all right so the another thing i want to mention i'm running out of time uh, is that actually there's another story associated with this, uh, which is the question of whether you can see condo effect with spin-on. So again, this is something exotic, right? So imagine that we actually have a spin-on Fermi surface, right? Um, then uh, if I put a magnetic impurity on top of it, coupled to it, uh, would I have a condo effect, right? Okay, so the experimentalist again actually did this experiment um and there's a paper that uh, should soon be coming out uh, um, on um, uh, posted okay what they did is they, they put they take the same system and they put a cobalt atom on top of it okay and so what do you expect to see and oh, okay let me just quickly tell you what they saw so this is the original thing before zero is here there's a lower hubba band, upper hubba band, two of them. But now what they see is that a peak showed up at the bottom, at the top of the lower hubba band, at the bottom of the second uh, upper hubba band. Okay. Yeah, so that's what they saw. <clears throat> so let me just quickly go over uh, the theory. Uh, well, some time ago, we actually considered this uh, a story and, uh, and we concluded that in fact, uh, a spin on Fermi surface would screen a condo uh, impurity in the, exactly the same way as an electron Fermi surface, right? Because actually it's only the spin channel in the electron that is doing the screening. So the, whether it's charged or not doesn't make any difference. However, we did not consider about, uh, what happens to the condo resonance because uh, in the condo problem, you know that there's a condo resonance at the Fermi surface. And this was seen first by a famous paper by Cromie's group. Uh, 20 years ago, they, at the Fermi level, they see some kind of a uh, fan of line shape, okay? But now the question is this, we have a charge gap. This is a charge insulator. So even if you form a condo insulator uh, resonance, where is that resonance? It cannot be at zero energy because we have a gap there. 
So that's a question that we, we study. So that's uh, just quickly, this is a quick uh, que uh, question that I studied with my postdoc, when you hate. And I think I don't have time to go over this now, but uh, to make a long story short, we have to make an Anderson model. Uh, it turns out a condo problem is not enough because we have the tunnel into this uh, impurity site. So a condo doesn't accept the electrons. So we have a condo a problem that is coupled to a uh, spin-on Fermi surface. And uh, let me just make a long story short. And it turns out that uh, indeed you can explain the experiment. Uh, so the, the spin-on in, indeed form a, a screening cloud uh, to screens out the spin of the impurity electron. But turns out that that's not enough within the theory. Um, the theory only gives you a step at the bottom of the, um, of the uh, conduction band. Uh, to get a peak structure like this, we have to assume that there's a binding between the spin on cloud and the charge on. So we restore an electron. So in, in other words, this thing has to become, the screening cloud has to become an electron cloud again in order to see this peak. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's the story. Okay, so since I, uh, I'm using up a lot of my time, let me go on to talk about the second uh, topic, tungsten ditaloide. Uh, um, okay, so forget about uh, spin ons for now, right? So this is a different problem. So the structure is quite similar. It's, uh, it's more distortion, but uh, again, the, the action is on the, uh, on the tungsten side. Okay. Uh, so I call this the jack of all trade in uh, TMD because uh, you know it's a quantum spin hole insulator. Uh, the edge modes has been seen up to very high temperature. It's a superconductor when you dope it. And recently, there's a Nature paper by the Sankans group that report uh, uh, oscillations of the resistivity that's periodic in one over B uh, that looks like quantum oscillation in metals. This, of course, is very strange. And they suggest some exotic explanation, fractionalized excitons and so on and so on, fermionic excitons. Uh, so the question I want to raise is this. Turns out that even what, what is the nature of the insulator was not clear. Um, so the, this, this group actually suggests that it's an excitonic insulator. And I'll explain to you what it is. The second is that, is there a more conventional explanation without appealing to uh, something exotic? Uh, even though I spend a lot of my life doing exotic physics, I usually prefer a simpler explanation if possible, whenever that's possible. You become exotic only when it's absolutely necessary. Um, so in a recent paper, I, I actually proposed that uh, there's a, a relatively conventional explanation of this, which I think is nevertheless quite interesting. Finally, uh, there's some, again, some experimental controversy about this. Uh, this is a suggestion that this may not be real. It may be coming from the graphite substrate, uh, but um, this is ongoing debate. So let me put this aside for now. Okay. So the experiment is this, they, they, they have a flake of uh, this tungsten uh, ditaride and uh, it's, uh, it's an insulator um, and uh, very good insulator, it's a mega ohms resistivity. But when they turn on the magnetic field, perpendicular magnetic field, they see oscillations of the resistivity, okay? And when they plot it over one over B is periodic. So it's periodic resistivity. Yeah, and, but this thing is an insulator. Right, so this is bizarre. Okay, and in one sample, they can get a low temperature and they can even see that this looks like uh, the you know, extremely costly oscillation for metal becomes sharp peaks, like you see in the uh, quantum Hall effect, right? So this is absolutely uh, 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 very unusual, right? So this is in the resistivity in an insulator. Okay, so. Uh, when I saw this, I thought, wow, can we do something very, very simple? And it turns out that you could with a very simple phenomenological model because an insulator has an exponential de dependence of the, uh, with temperature, with a gap. So what if you have a modulation in the gap that is periodic in one over B, right? So instead of the, yeah. So uh, it turns out that if you do that, then, you, uh, then if you plot the ratio of the resistivity or the conductivity, with the background, then that clearly has modulation that's given by this. But the important point is that this modulation is now controlled 
by the ratio of the size of the modulation to the temperature it has nothing to do with the gap itself. So all you need is a tiny modulation of the, if they see this at one Kelvin, all you need or uh, half a degree, all you need is a tiny modulation of a few uh, Kelvin um, out of a gap of um, 100 Kelvin. And you will see exactly in the ratio, you will see a small modulation at high temperature and at low temperature, uh, not even not that low and delta over KT is four, you will see this sharp spike. So phenomenologically, <clears throat> you can explain this data. And of course, the, the origin of this is really has to do with the power of exponential growth, right? If you have something that's growing exponentially, um, a very small modulation in the in the coefficient can give you a big effect. And of course, we even a man on the street now today understand exponential growth. Okay, so then the question is, what is the origin of this modulation? What causes this modulation uh, in an insulator? Okay, so for, as I said, uh, one possibility is that the experiment is extrinsic. The whole thing is not real. Uh, the other possibility is that if I have an exotonic insulator, if this, uh, this insulator is actually an exotonic insulator, then you can have this modulation. And this is built on an earlier work by Nole and uh, Nigel Cooper and by Fa Wang's group uh, about five years ago. Okay, so let me now uh, just take a five minutes or so to tell you what the exotonic insulator is. Yeah, so this is something actually uh, interesting when it was also first proposed by Mott. Uh, <clears throat> he pointed out that in a semi-metal, where you have an electron and a hole band, then the electron and hole can form a bound state, which is an exciton. And if the binding is strong enough, they can actually both condense and form an insulator. There's a kind of weaker version of this, uh, a band theory version of this by Caldis and Kopayev. And there's a famous review by Jerome Rice and Cohn uh, to formulate it as a, uh, uh, as a nesting problem. So the, uh, the picture is quite simple, right? You have a conduction band and you, you have a valence band. So if you just shift this over, then you're overlapping con conduction band and con valence band, and then you just gap this out. And so you can form an insulator. So in that limit, uh, the, the theory looks very BCS-like. You just have a, uh, uh, a finite uh, shift modulation. So it's, it's like a charge density wave, but it involves two different bands, the electron and the whole band. Okay. <clears throat> right. Now it turns out that um, if you look at the band structure, the band structure uh, is rather complicated, but at the low, low, low lying part, it actually consists of a, a very small electron pocket at the gamma point, a hole pocket, and, a, uh, and two uh, electron pocket in the middle of the zone, like this. Okay. Right. So according to the band theory, this should actually be the semi-metal, right? And in fact, the, uh, so if, you, if I blow up this thing, it looks like this. There's a whole band and two conduction band minimum. So the Fermi surface is actually, even at exactly uh, integer filling, I would have a whole pocket and two electron pocket. Of course, the area of the two electron pocket has up to be the same as the one of a whole pocket, okay? Right. So this um, suggests that, so first of all, we didn't even understand why this thing was uh, insulated in the first place. Um, to, uh, because this is <laughs> this insulator is this exotic uh, topologic insulator, right? Um, but now the suggestion is that this is actually uh, an example of, a, um, of an exotonic insulator, that these, um, the gap is formed because of uh, Coulomb attraction between the electron and hole. Uh, so maybe the very low density uh, carrier density favors this exotonic mechanism. Uh, I should say that um, there are no, not many examples of exotonic insulators. Um, uh, another uh, uh, tit titanium disulfide has, has been claimed to be one, uh, but in that case it's commensurate and it may be phonon driven. So there's some controversy about the origin of this. But in this case, the interesting thing is that if this is the case, this will be an incommensurate uh, uh, um, exotonic insulator. I think this is probably the, the first example if this is confirmed. <clears throat> so what's the mechanism? It turns out that uh, well, these people were considering 
this issue in connection with uh, some similar observation in thymarine hescoborite, which is a condo uh, lattice, a condo insulator, but it involves a crossing of two bands again. So the so I think I could, we just I just borrow the story for the excitonic insulator case. So again, the excitonic insulator is that we have an electron band and a hole band, right? And the Fermi level is here. Uh, the Fermi level, oops, what I, what I do? The Fermi level is here. And uh, so at the Fermi level, then we have, if I have a magnetic field, before turning on the excitonic coupling, I have a discrete Fermi level. And on the electron band, the Fermi levels will be rising up uh, uh, with increasing magnetic field. And on the whole side, the, the lambda level will be going down right, in magnetic field, right? So they go in the opposite direction. So at the Fermi level, they collide and they hybridize by, by this exotonic gap, right? And so in that case, they form these gaps. But now you can see that because it's, they are formed out of uh, uh, Landau level, the gap actually remember that they came from Landau level that was metallic. So there will be modulation in the gap uh, shown here. I'm not controlling my thing very well. So maybe I go back to my, uh, my this thing is not doing well. Um, yeah, so you can see that uh, there are these modulation in the, in, the, um, in the band gap. So are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, I believe. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that <laughs> <laughs> some feedback is useful. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be finished in five minutes. Okay. Oh, so, actually, you can go over time. Yeah, there's yeah. no time limit, actually, but okay. anyway. <laughs> All right, yeah, there was some technical difficulty. Yeah, so, but now you can see from this that um, the gap is modulated, okay? Right. Um, so even though this is an insulator, because it's, it's an it's exotonic insulator that were formed out of two metals, two metallic surfaces, <clears throat> it actually <clears throat> remember <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the uh, quantum, quantum oscillation of the metal that it came from. So that's the main message. So this is a mechanism where an insulator can have a periodic modulation in this gap. Okay, so that's the main message, right? And now if you combine this with my first uh, simple um, uh, phenological model, then we can explain the, the experiment, okay? But uh, as always, there's always some uh, caveats. Wait a minute, so now I'm somehow, I cannot. Advance my. No, I cannot advance my slide. Okay, let me try this. Something is not working right. Yeah, so now I'm not controlling my mouse very well. Patrick, are you trying to go forward? Yeah, try to go forward. I can. Uh, you you can use your keyboard, I believe. Yeah, it doesn't work. I, oh, oh, there, okay. It works. It works. And then it works. Okay. Yeah, it works now. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one complication in that um, we actually have two electron bands and one hole band, right? <clears throat> so if we if I had one electron band and one hole band, then there's perfect nesting. If they're both spherical, if they're both circular, right? They have. Uh, but if I have two of them, then they have different areas. So in general, there's no perfect nesting. And then you need a strong attraction to open a, this uh, gap. Uh, and uh, to make a long story short, it's not that obvious that my gap modulation would survive. Okay. And uh, so after my uh, first simple paper, I uh, recruited my postdoc, uh, the same one you uh, heard again, uh, to look at this two gap. Uh, two Fermi surface, uh, two electron band, one whole band picture. Okay. And so we formulate this. Now we have a three band uh, 
three by three matrix with uh, interaction. And the new physics is that, you know, your question is how do you shift this Q? Naively, you just want to shift it so that uh, uh, the Q is uh, just the separation between the center. But uh, that may not be the best strategy because you could shift it so that they, they are tangential. In other words, I can take advantage of the nesting between this edge and this edge, right? So I may want to shift it so that uh, um, the, 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 this guy has gone over here and, and, and so on, right? And I cannot control this very well. Yeah. Um, so, um, right. And, and, and then in that case, it's no longer so clear that you have this, uh, um, um, this modulation. Now again, I lost my. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he actually uh, solved the problem in Landau gauge. And uh, so to make a long story short, um, it, um, it turns out that the answer depends very much on the relative anisotropy of the electron and hole band. If they're both have the same anisotropy, namely that then you can uh, nest them uh, perfectly, then you can always get this uh, modulation. But if they have different anisotropy, so if you look at the, the top uh, picture on the right, uh, you can see that the hole is more elongated than the conduction electron, right? So the anisotropy has changed. It's the relative anisotropy that, that matters, right? Uh, then it turns out that the, the bigger this anisotropy parameter, which we call gamma, uh, as you increase it, then you start losing your uh, quantum modulation, right? So here I show the example of this calculation for anisotropy of 1.5, 2, and 3, okay? So uh, at 2, you can still see the modulation uh, in the middle panel, uh, but by 3, you, you lose it. Now, in the experiment, gamma, we estimate is between 2 and 3. So it's, it's kind of marginal, but at 2, from the lower uh, panel, you can see that I can still see modulation. On the right lowest panel, I can see the conductivity uh, indeed exhibit this uh, modulation as a function of magnetic field uh, that we expect from the experiment. Okay, so the speculation, we didn't do a fully self-consistent calculation. The speculation is that in, the, in that case, the system was self-tuned to a well-nested situation to maximize the gap. And we may find a, uh, get this gap modulation over some reasonable range of parameter space. But, uh, my conclusion is that uh, the situation is, the story is not that obvious, whether uh, even if this were a mechatonic insulator, whether this quantum uh, oscillation, this gap modulation would survive uh, because uh, of this two hole, two electron, one hole uh, situation. Okay, so that brings the end to, to my uh, story. It's a little bit long, but uh, I thought it's interesting to contrast these two uh, uh, TMD uh, monolayer system uh, both have very exotic and uh, unusual, uh, and I think very beautiful properties. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, uh, now it's open to questions. Okay, uh, so there is a question from the chat and I can really, uh, how can spin density waves of spin ons, uh, which are, neutral under electron charge lead to modulation of electron charge density? Um, yeah, there's nothing that, nothing that tells you, uh, there's nothing against it, let's put it that way. Right? Because you can induce, you can induce uh, something in the electron. There, there are electrons uh, around, right? Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you can, you can think of it as a virtual coupling if you like. Because uh, it's gap, right? So it's not a metal, but there, there you, know, you, you can induce a charge modulation in, in an insulator, right? By polarization, for example. So, so a, a an insulator is polarizable. So, so it's possible. Okay. Um. So, sorry. So, I, the um. So, is is there is it via some kind of spin orbit coupling? That no, you don't need it. Okay, yeah, I was just a bit confused because I thought the spinners are like completely neutral under electron charge, so there's no way they can come no, but they're, Okay, and actually, uh, they're not completely neutral in the sense uh, 
because you know, now you have to go back a, a step. Uh, you know, the spin ions actually couple to a gauge field. Mm -hmm. they, they have gauge charge. Mm -hmm. The gauge charge can couple to the charge because the, uh, the, the um, there's a, you know, you, we do spin charge separation. There's a right. spin on and there's boson. Right. The boson carry the charge. Mm -hmm. okay. And both spin on the boson carries gauge charge. Right. Okay. So the spin on can induce a charge in the boson sector by the, mm -hmm. by the gauge field. So there's some kind of coupling between the, uh, like the, the emergent gauge field and the actual gauge field? No, you don't need it. Um, because the, the both the fermions and the boson carry the gauge field. But they're different gauge fields, right? One of no, it's the same gauge field. Forget about the electro, even oh, forget okay. about electromagnetic field, even right. if it's a charge system, right? We can put it back later, right? right? But but here to answer your question, the important thing is to consider the gauge field. Uh -huh. So the fermion couples the gauge field and the boson couples the same gauge field. And that's very essential because that is needed, that's the constraint. Of no double occupation, right? right? So the gauge field is absolutely essential, right? And in fact, it's the gauge field that makes these want to bind. Okay. When I talked about these uh, spin-on condo problem, I want actually to bind the spin-on with the boson, and the mechanism is the gauge field. Okay. Right. So they want to form back an electron. So the every chance it has, the form fermion would like to get back its charge. Okay. It's actually not that happy without losing, having lost its charge, right? Mm. So the gauge field is the one that wants to pull back its charge. So that's a very natural binding uh, to the charge. So, yeah. Ah, I see. Okay. So, so this won't work in the like strong mod limit where the uh, like where the charge gap is essentially infinite. Then, uh, no, then... it will work even in the TJ model yeah, because the gauge field is is still there. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I was confused. Okay. Is there any other question? So maybe I can ask, uh, okay, Mason, please. Hi, Patrick. Hey, <laughs> how are you? Uh, I had a question about the first part of the story. So when you took this, when you were talking about this tantalum diselenide yeah. and the 2D limit. Right. And so that you said it was gapped, right? Yeah. Um, but then you you were talking about this spin on Fermi surface and then you drew these momentum vectors. Right. Uh, so I didn't quite understand how that fully gaps the Fermi surface. Oh, because the, it's the charge sector that is gapped. Oh, the charge sector is gapped. Yeah, so when you oh, do so SDM- you still have you, the gap, you still, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. When you do SDM, you add an electron. So you add a charge and a spin. Ah, uh, okay. So they, they, did, they haven't looked at like thermal conductivity or something. Uh, not in one layer. You cannot do that in one you layer. Cannot. I see. Yeah. Well, at least I, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's right, challenging. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, see, yeah. I see. That, that would be amazing if they can do thermal conductivity. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. I see. Maybe, so the it's, pos maybe it's possible. In the quantum hall, they can do one. Exactly. Layer. So the proposal is that this is a gap. This is a gapless spin on Fermi surface there, but exactly. there's also this ordering on top of it. That's right. I see. And you may end up gapping the whole thing or you may end up uh, partially gapping it. I don't know. But anyway, the, the charge is already gapped. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, so yeah. So, so what happens to the thermal conductivity at the end of the day, I don't know. Uh-huh, I see. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Maybe I can ask a, a, a question. So I always try to uh, contrast this, uh, uh, this uh, second part of the talk, I mean the tungsten ditelluride uh, with the Indian arsenide uh, quantum well system. Because uh, I think both of the system, they have uh, quantum spin hole effect and uh, also can be uh, as a tiny insulator. I think, I, I'm just curious why uh, they have this uh, similar feature is probably due to their band structure or sound or there is anything deeper yeah actually well, i don't know I, I, as far as i understand the topological aspect is totally separate from the exotonic aspect mm -hmm. uh, you, you, uh, well we need a semi well they're not separate in the sense that 
to have the topological insulator, you need to have an exotonic insulator, because right? otherwise you have a semi-metal. Right? So you need to have a exotonic right? first. Yeah, I believe that's that's. Uh, I see. Yeah. So actually, I didn't. I'm not familiar with the uh, indium arsenide story. So that's a so, that's to be exotonic insulator. Yeah. So so it's a. I, I'm thinking of lots of experiments by Ray Ray Du. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think they originally they, they report something about the quantum spin hole, but uh, uh, of course there are some controversy. But yeah, I think right. eventually they come in and say, oh, they still they, they actually have that demonstrate nice quantum spin hole effect. Mm -hmm. But there were also some proposal that are showing uh, it, it could be as a tiny insulator, and they also have an experimental paper on that. Uh, but I didn't, I, I'm only working on quantum spin hole aspect. I didn't actually look. Yeah, the, it would be actually interesting to go back and look at that to see whether they, you may you may expect to see some uh, uh, quantum quantum oscillations. Actually, they did. They did see a quantum oscillation. They did? In the yes. Thing. I can, maybe I can send you a paper later. Yeah, that I, I'm familiar with those things. Because uh, I think that may be a one hole, one electron story, right? Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not okay. I I won't get only working on the field theory of the age. I'm not working on the box. So <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. I, I and also the the bed structure could be quite complicated. Yeah, it could be complicated. Yeah, but I, I remember they had to add a disorder by hand to Anderson localize the box. I see. Yeah, that's <laughs> not good. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, just a curiosity question. So you show this interesting idea, a proposal that uh, using the uh, condo effect between a spin on and the uh, uh, magnetic moment. I'm curious if there is any one dimensional model can teach us something about this effect. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I, probably, yeah, you, you probably, you can probably do a, some exact dissolvable model. Yeah. But, but you need to probably have a but, 1D chain with yeah, a 1D spin chain and a, and a condo. Yeah, I'm sure that has been done. Yeah, you can, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm sure you can solve that exactly. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah, some kind of uh, right? Isn't that? Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I shouldn't say for sure, but uh, okay. That should be doable, right? Because it's so yeah, much. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Bosonization. You can do both. Yes. And, yeah, that would be a uh, interesting uh, avenue. Yeah. Because because uh, this uh, condo event, this is uh, the first thing I learned about is that uh, it can reduce to one dimensional problem. Yeah. And so, but I think the problem there is that you don't have the charge gap. If you, you, you just do one D usually, right? Mm -hmm. You have a metal. And the ground state is always a metal. So, so here the novelty is that you have a you have an insulating gap. I see. Right. So I don't think there's a fixed point where you have a gap, and a spin on and gap spin on. Right. You either have a uh, superconductor. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, or a uh, metal, right, in 1D. Uh, unless you're kind, of, maybe, unless you can make a commensurate. Uh, maybe one has to cook up some exotic yeah. model to realize this. So conventional locking liquid certainly yeah, couldn't yeah, be. I don't, think, I don't think there's a, as far as I know, I don't think there's a, yeah, because the spin charge separation is different in 1D. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's different, yeah. There's no yeah. gauge field, there's no, uh, yeah, it's, it's purely bosonization. Yeah, so I think that's I a different story. Okay. Okay, if there is any question. I actually, could I ask another question? Oh, please, yeah. please. Did they, did they look for uh, Friedel oscillations near this impurity? Yeah, they tried, you know, Sento and uh, you know, Moros Mor had some prediction. Yeah. Various people have prediction. yeah. Nobody has seen that. I know, I know various people have tried that. I see. So in this, in this yeah. material, they did, they did look for it, they just didn't see yeah. it? Didn't see it. I see. Yeah. Maybe it's not there. We said maybe they didn't see it. Yeah. So, yeah. So we don't have it. That would be our even more direct evidence. Yeah. But unfortunately, we don't have that. Okay. okay. Um, if there is no any other question, and let's thank Patrick again. Thank you for uh, such a wonderful talk yeah. and nice discussion. Yeah. No, it was a good discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, I will send you the papers later. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all right.
Thank you.